The Bucket Plan On Demand series is brought to you by Clarity to Prosperity, a financial training, coaching, and IP development organization led by financial advisors, coaches, and business leaders committed to taking a holistic approach on advising. To learn more about our organization and upcoming training opportunities for financial professionals, visit ClarityToProsperity.com. Welcome to the Bucket Plan On Demand webinar. This is the first in a new series offered by Clarity to Prosperity. During today's webcast, how do you increase your closing ratio by 72.3%, Dave Allison and Jason Smith will walk you through the information you need to know and the questions to ask to increase your closing ratio. So Dave, how'd you come up with that uh, closing the closing ratio by 72.3% anyway? Well, there was a, a lot of wisdom and insight behind that. You know, Jason, something that we learned is uh, I think 83% of all statistics are made up on the spot. So no <laughs> doubt about that. The 72.3 the exact is, uh, is one of those 83% of statistics that are made up on the spot. But the reality of what we're going to talk about today is whether it increases your closing ratio by... 20%, 50%, 100%, or even 72.3%. There's uh, there's no doubt about it. You'll see increased success with the questions that we're going to talk through and the concepts we're going to cover in today's webinar. Beautiful, beautiful. So I'm super excited about this, this new on-demand series. And this is coupled with the white paper that we're doing and the podcast all around the same topic. So you have multiple ways to learn uh, about the information. You know, I've been saying for years um, that there's a lot of sophistication and simplicity. I mean, how long have I been saying that? As long as I could remember. Yeah. And so what was so cool about it is I've never seen this quote till more recently. And I'm like, oh, my God. As soon as I saw it, I'm like, this is absolutely perfect because this is this is uh, what the bucket plan is all about. And uh, Leonardo da Vinci. I thought it was Leonardo DiCaprio at first. Do you think he was actually talking about the bucket plan back then? I think he was. I think he was. Great foresight. All right. So Clarity and Prosperity. At its core, uh, just real quickly for those, uh, just as a refresher, or those who haven't really heard a lot about us yet, um, is holistic planning. So comprehensive financial planning is all about what we do to our core. Dave's a financial planner, I'm a financial planner, and uh, we're, we're practicing and we're also training advisors how to do a better job at what we call holistic planning. And, and how we describe that is uh, it's comprehensive financial planning, bringing in the taxes, financial, legal, insurance, social security, and Medicare, all into one comprehensive and holistic plan. Now, leading through example, it's kind of like what I was just talking about. I've been part of uh, financial institutions, RIAs, BGAs, FMOs, IMOs throughout my career. Um, and a lot of times the leadership was kind of like in an ivory tower. They used to do it, but now they were coming up with ideas, coming up with concepts and, you know, almost using us as crash dummies. Well, we use ourselves as the crash dummy. So, so I'm proud to say my office brought in 43 million in new assets last year. Our goal is 62 million this year, on track for 100 million in 2021. And so we're leading through example. We're seeing clients. We're doing. We're all doing the same thing, rowing the boat in the same direction. And then ultimately, um, to duplicate the success that other advisors are having you know it's one thing thing going to a conference and taking pages and pages of notes um and then going back to your practice to try to figure it out on your own the other thing is when you can plug into step-by-step -step package proven processes audios videos scripts checklists flow charts um, templates everything you would need to duplicate the success that you've seen that other advisors are having, and that's what Clarity to Prosperity really stands for. All right, so I, uh, Dave, you went through Sandler Sales Training, which both of us have followed that group through the years and used some of their concepts that we picked up, but you've actually gone through their formal uh, training and their management program, so um, talk about that a little bit. 
Yeah, absolutely. So for those of you who aren't familiar, Sandler is the, the global sales trainer uh, out there. They've got, I think, something like 250 sales training offices across the world. And, uh, and, and when you think about sales, there's, there's really two primary methodologies to sales. There's to go out there and sell on features and benefits, or there's the, the, uh, the methodology of really uncovering and getting to know your prospect's pain, and then matching the unique services and knowledge that you have to help your clients overcome that pain. And so Sandler, that whole organization and, and a big principle they teach is, is really understanding and getting to know what your prospect's pain is and then, you know, creating action through that pain. And so uh, as, I, as I've gone through some of the different trainings, and I think so many established, experienced financial advisors understand this already, one of the most important things that you can do early on, really in that first meeting process, is get to know your prospect's pain. And one of the quickest ways that we get to know our prospect's pain is by asking great questions. And so questions, I mean, the, the, the difference between some of the most successful advisors in the industry and others that at some times can struggle is successful advisors, they just generally ask better questions, right, to inspire those prospects to move forward. And so this is where we're going to spend some time talking about this in today's webinar. And just to lead into that, I want to I want to talk a little bit about buying emotions, because this is actually a concept that that I picked up in the Sandler training that that we went through. And it made a lot of common sense, you know, when I related it back to the financial planning business that we do. And so when we're sitting down with our prospects in that first appointment, one of the things that we want to do outside of relationship development, getting to know them, making the personal connection, is we want to understand buying emotions. And we're going to talk about that other stuff a little bit later in this presentation about making the connection and getting to know them and the importance of that. But I'm going to start with buying emotion because I think it starts to set the stage for the rest of the client process. I mean, there's really four stages or categorization of buying emotion. There's pain in the present. There's pain in the future. There's pleasure in the present and there's pleasure in the future. And this is just sales psychology. It goes across any industry. And if you think about it, people are more motivated or inspired to take action if they have some sort of pain in the present. And ultimately, that's what we want as financial professionals, right? We don't want them to go 6, 12, 18 months through our process before they take action. We want to make them a client as quickly as possible. And so to do that, we need to identify what is their pain in the present. Maybe they don't have any pain in the present, but there could be opportunity for pain in the future. And, and I use a, a couple analogies here. I show my cartoon ambulance on the screen. I mean, if somebody is gonna go into the emergency room with a broken arm, they're not going to talk to the doctor about what solutions are and then think it over or wanna leave and go to three other ERs to, you know, to interview different doctors to see who's got the best procedure to fix their arm, right? That's pain in the present. They want that fixed. They want the drugs. They want, they want it put back in place. Now, if you think about financial services, you know, we work with a diverse group of clients, but I'll use a, a quick analogy, right? Let's say you were meeting with a 35 or a 40 year old and you're having your first meeting with them and you're spending all the time talking about retirement planning something that might not happen for 20 or 30 years into the future. And that's a pleasure, right? To be able to be financially free to stop working one day. That's a pleasure in the future. Is that 30 or 40 year old gonna really be excited and, and inspired and hey, I need to take action today on what the recommendations this guy or this lady just told me? Maybe, but probably not as likely, right? Maybe you are so good or you really made that personal connection with them that they're going to move forward with you. I mean, honestly, it's like if people are within five years sometimes or, or sometimes within a year, yeah. they, they don't have enough, you know, pain in the present to take, you know. Abs yeah. Absolutely. Now yeah. think about that same 35-year-old, right? Now they just have a new baby. 
They're both, they don't have a lot of savings. They're not financially free, but you talk to them about the importance of life insurance. And if one of the two of them were to pass away, the devastating effect that that would have on pain their family, the right? That's right. that's pain in the future. It's right. not today. Hopefully it's not to to today, right. but it's probably going to inspire them to become a client of yours a little bit more than trying to sell them on the retirement dream 20 or 30 years in the future. So that's just an example of understanding your prospects buying emotions. And as Jason mentioned, he deals with a lot of retirees in the JL Smith group. And so showing them pain, showing them major catastrophic mistakes that they could potentially make today that could derail the next 20, 30 years of retirement, right? That's a pain. That's a pain in the present because maybe they're going to stop working in a couple months. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. Well, the pain in the present, the bottom line is they're there to see you for a reason. They wouldn't agree to an appointment. I think too often what advisors do is they make the mistake of following their own agenda instead of following the client's agenda. I mean, there was some kind of pain that they're there for. I mean, there's a reason they, they came in. They didn't just come in because they like you or you're a good looking guy. Yeah, that's so true. And you're exactly right. Sometimes people jump too far ahead, right? Trying to tell them all the things that they do, all the features and benefits before really uncovering what that reason is that they're in the office. And And in some cases, I mean, Jason, how many times have you had this happen where they don't know why they're there, right? They know, hey, maybe I should be talking to somebody, but they don't know all of the risks that they face in retirement. They've never heard of sequence of returns risk or longevity risk. And so, point, right? Absolutely. In some cases, you got to create the pain. And that's so important to do in that first meeting. When process. you were given the life insurance example, even I'm thinking about like that pain in the future, how you could turn it into the present. By having them, like, re realistically, if you died today, what exactly would, would happen? What would your wife sell? What would be the what would be the move she would make financially to be able to take care of your family? Now, all of a sudden, you make it real. You can turn that pain in the future actually into pain. Like, really brilliant life insurance salesmen, which we both met a lot of them. You know, that's what they have the ability to do. Absolutely. So as you're in that that, that appointment, right? Always be thinking, is this a pleasure or a pain? Because you want to try to focus on pain. People are more motivated by pain than they are pleasure, right? And then think, is this present or is this future? And that was uh, fantastic of how do we bring it more towards the present and, and, and less from the future. So that's the first thing that we want to focus on. And how you do this is you ask great thought provoking and probing questions. And so I just wanted to share th this kind of ideology of pain questions, right? The first thing that you want to do is identify what that pain is. What's the business reason that they're in the office? And Jason mentioned this earlier, far too often we can skip this, right? What's the most pressing thing on their mind? What's the personal impact to them? So again, you did a great, we go back to this 35 year old in the life insurance, we identified the pain, right? If the breadwinner passed away, then the next thing Jason did kind of subconsciously is What's the personal impact, right? What assets would you sell? What would you, how would you go get a second job? Who would raise the kids? Who would pay for the daycare, right? What's the personal impact of that? The third is what's their commitment to fixing it, right? Because we've all run into people that no matter how big the pain is, they're just like waffly people right. and they're how not- How important is this to you? Why is it important? You asked those kind of, right? Absolutely, yeah. because if they're not committed to fixing it, you're probably going to have a lower chance of making them a client. Then the next is just summarizing. So once you've identified it, you've made them verbalize the personal impact that it would, ha it would have. You've gotten a commitment that they want to do something about it. Then you go back and summarize and you just say, let me make sure I completely understand everything you just shared with me. You shared with me this, this, and this. Does that sound about right? And you're this, just remember, identify personal impact, commitment, and summarize. And then something Jason is actually a master of is what we call probing questions, right? So if you identify the personal impact, hey, you know what, can you tell me a little bit more about that? How do you feel about that? Can you be more specific? Can you give me an example of that? How long has it been a problem for you? What have you actually tried to do to fix it in the past? 
How much do you think it's cost you, right? So these are probing questions that you can use because the best people in sales, they uncover the pain, but then they go way deeper, right? You have to go deeper and these probing questions are what allow you to go deeper with your prospect. Yeah, fantastic. So those are just a couple ideas of uncovering pain, asking probing, thought-provoking questions, getting them to... One, one of the things too, sorry, yeah. I, not to interrupt, but the, uh, the thing that I think too many advisors do out there is they're doing, as they're asking questions, is they ask the question and then they don't really listen. You know, and, and that's the thing. You're, you're thinking about the next question you're going to ask, or you're thinking about the next thing you're going to talk about, or the next thing you're going to do, and you're not really listening. So if you're going to ask a question, listen to the answer. And when you listen, it means you're, you're going to ask follow-up questions naturally if you're really listening. And so, uh, and, and, and it almost sounds silly sometimes. It's like, Okay, uh, you know, what's, uh, what are they concerned about? They're concerned about running out of money. Tell me more about that. Why, why, why are you concerned about that? Most advisors will never ask that follow-up question because they'll feel stupid. Like they're like, well, of course, nobody wants to run out of money. But when you ask those follow-up questions, it makes it real. Now they're expanding and they're getting deep and they're going to share with you, well, you know, my mom ran out of money because my dad, you know, had a heart attack and lost his job. And then later on or, or whatever, they're going to everybody has stories. And so what you want to do is get them telling you their stories because now it makes it real to them. They're connected to that pain. Absolutely. I mean, I just had a first appointment on Friday. So just a couple days ago and we literally so we blocked an hour and a half for the first meeting, just like we normally do. We spent 45 minutes because they were they were every time I asked them one of these probing questions, they were able to just keep giving more and more information, which created a, a scenario where they sold themselves on why they needed me. At the end of it, at the 45 minutes, they were like, all right, Dave, so how do we fix all this? Like, we know that this needs to be fixed. How do we fix it? And it was simply like, okay, well, we just need to gather a little bit more data. I'll share with you what our fees or our costs are to move forward with our planning process. And at the end of it, you know, when I quoted them the planning fee, there was no hesitation that what they were going to get in return of giving them the peace of mind because of how deep we went on the pain questions absolutely validated and justified the cost to move forward. And so what you'll find is that if you do a good job here, you won't have a lot of procrastination. You won't have a lot of think it over. People will be more inclined to implement quicker than if you skip a lot of this stuff because it's just so, the, the personal impact and the psychology behind it is so important. That's great. So um, we're, gonna, we're gonna take some of the components of the fact finder that uh, I know Dave and I both use and we teach tons of advisors around the country that use it. And there's a specific ordering of the questions and certain things that are color coded and shaded that are best practice to act, uh, ask in the first meeting versus uh, uh, others that you can gather throughout the process. Um, but we, uh, you know, this fact finder is something that I'm really proud of because Probably, you know, 20 years ago, I started asking people if they had a fact finder because I'd read in a book or heard from somebody that it was all about questions. And I've learned that throughout my career that it is all about questions. And the be for people who ask the best questions are the ones that are the best in a consultative type of sales approach. And so, um, so the thing is, is we put this together and there's a very specific order to these questions and we're going to sh share some of the highlights. And I just want to chime in too, because I think that far too often, um, people think of fact finders, experienced advisors think of fact finders that like rookies use, right? It's just, Hey, you need to use this tool because you don't know the right questions to ask. And at Clarity, we redefined this entire fact finder. It's not just a set of financial data you need to gather to make recommendations. There's an entire kind of psychological shift of what questions we ask, how we ask them, when we ask them. 
And the reality of it is, even for the most experienced financial advisors out there, sometimes we just forget to ask questions, right? And so by having this fact finder gives us a roadmap of exactly what we need to ask and when we should ask it, that it, and it's not something that's just done in the first meeting. Like, how do you use this fact finder, Jason, throughout your planning process? Yeah, I mean, I, I use it in all meetings leading up to the meeting where I eventually make my product and portfolio recommendations with the bucket plan. And so um, there are shaded parts in blue that are best practices to always ask in the first meeting. But ultimately, you know, if I got a smaller opportunity that maybe they don't have a lot of money or a lot of complexity to their situation, I might get through the bulk of the fact finder all in the first meeting, if not all of it. Um, but I get somebody who is more of a talker and we go deeper on the probing questions. And, you know, it's they got a lot of complexity got going around, going on and a lot of assets then I'm really just hitting on those shaded blue ones, which are the key ones that I want to make sure I'm hitting in the first appointment because they're also ones that really add a lot level of engagement. And if you look at like that first section, client basic information, that's stuff that when they confirm the appointment, my admin or my team's gathering all that because I want to make sure I have all that so I can market to them in the future. You know, I want, want to grab their cell phone number, their email address or date of birth and be able to market them in the future, even if they cancel and never come see me for that very first appointment. At least we got their data and we can keep marketing to them. So, you know, we mentioned at the opening, there's really two components of asking great questions. We started off with pain, right? How do you ask questions around identifying pain points or concerns, challenges for the prospects, but the other aspect of asking great questions is the relationship development and connection process, right? Bonding and rapport. Yeah. Bonding and rapport to simplify it. It's all about making the connection. So Jason, you've been asking some of these early questions in the fact finder for a long time. Can you, can you talk a little bit about kind of how you open up with some of these questions that we have in the webinar right now. Yeah, one of the things is like, just from a courtesy standpoint, I remember years ago, I was sitting down with a gentleman and I was taking down all the notes and I could feel he was a little bit uneasy because you're asking personal information and you know confidential information. So I asked him, do you mind if I take some notes while we talk? And, uh, and it's just a courtesy to open it, really. It's an opener, opening statement, really, because no one ever says no. And then it also sets up while I'm why I'm using like kind of sets up I'm using this fact finder because I use the fact finder every time because I've tried throughout the years to wing it and go back to notepads and then I forget questions <laughs> like you said Dave and then I'm kicking myself because I missed them and so uh, one of the things too is I'll ask him you know was there anything you talked about on the ride over here that you'd like to discuss today. Because see, too often, like I mentioned before, we get into our own agenda and, 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 and we lose sight of the fact that they came in for a reason. Nine out of 10 times, you know, they had something on their mind. And if you don't ask that and get it out of their head and address it right up front that you're going to cover it in that meeting, then what are they going to be thinking about the whole time as you're asking all the other questions, they're going to be thinking about one thing. Am I, do I have an opportunity to ask about that, right? Or what? how's that work? And so, so I want to get that out right away. Then from there, I go into really the Dan Sullivan question. And so, um, and, and it followed up with DOS, dangers, opportunities, and strengths. And so here it is, and this is something I learned through Strategic Coach. And uh, if anybody's uh, uh, interested in this, uh, just hit us up and let us know. And we'll get you a book sent out to you. Uh, it's a quick, easy little read on the Dan Sullivan question. But ultimately, it's pretty simple. And I, you know, I just, would you mind sharing with me is how I set it up. And normally, if I'm sitting there, Dave, like I'll lean back and I'll kind of cross my legs and make it very com uh, uh, conversational, right? And so I want them to understand I'm asking a big picture question, right? So you might share with me, if we're sitting here three years from today and we're looking back to today, what will have needed to happen for you to feel happy about the progress that you've made? 
And so people and people are going to be like, wow, that's a good question. Or they're just going to pause and you got to let them kind of download it for a second before they respond. Or they're going to come back and be like, well, what do you mean? And financially, and I'll say, well, financially, but also big picture, life in general. It's important that I understand what you're, what's important to you, you know, for us to have a relationship and for me to be able to best help you. So it's a, you're going to get great thing. Like you asked the question, Dave, what kind of stuff do you get when you ask people that? I mean, they basically tell you almost what you need to do to make them a client, right? They tell you that they just want peace of mind to know they're on the right track or they're making the right decision around retirement or that, you know, they're frustrated with paying too much in taxes or, I mean, it really just comes out to be whatever's on their mind, whatever, you know, whatever they feel like there might be, you know, an opportunity to enhance or improve or they want clarification or peace of mind around. So um, it could be around, you know, the investments that they own. It could be around just a coordination of an overall plan. Yep. So, and then you run into some stuff personally. Um, I just had, a, again, a, a prospect in a first appointment last week who uh, her company got acquired by another big national company. And she's just like, I just want to know I have safety and security in my job, right? right? And that if I don't, I have a financial plan that's in place to make sure that I could weather any short-term storm of finding a new one. But like, what better information to have than that early on in the appointment process? No doubt. And then, you know, we follow that up because they're going to give you some stuff, uh, some bullet points, but I'll follow that up. Are there any concerns, fears, or dangers that might hold you back from reaching these goals? Hypothetically, if there was something that kept you up at night, what might that be? And I love that follow up, like hypothetically, if there was something that kept you up at night, what might that be? Because if you just ask it without asking that, sometimes keep people kind of get frozen or immediate responses like, no, I'm good. And so, but you even still sometimes get people who are like, no, I'm good. We're pretty positive people, mm -hmm. not really anything. And so then at there, we created a document um, called the Concerns and Priorities Worksheet. Yeah, so this tool is amazing. I, I use this in every first appointment. I think that it's something that can really help advisors uncover pain. So, you know, maybe as an advisor, probably not one of my bigger strengths is asking great questions to uncover pain. I'm getting better at it, but I use this tool as a crutch. Um, and this helps me exponentially because that isn't one of my stronger points in the sales process. And so, uh, it's pretty simple. I basically slide one over to the husband and wife, or I'll have it up on the big screen TV if if, uh, if we're looking at the TV together. And I'll just share with them, you know, we've been asking that question for a lot of years, and we've documented some of the responses of our, our prospects and clients over the years. And sometimes I find that you might say, you know what, I'm good, no real major concerns, but but when you look at this tool, it might spark some things that, number one, you didn't know were a concern, but once you're educated on them, they actually turn out to be one. Or number two, it just spurs or jars your memory a little bit. So what I'd like to do is take a minute or two and each of you separately go through and rank these in number one and number two or a number three. So basically a number one, if it's something that you're most concerned about. A number three, if it's something that's of least concern to you. And then a number two, if it's a concern, but maybe it's not a top concern. And so just go ahead, like for example, the first one, running out of money. If that's a top concern to you, rank it in number one. If it's not a concern at all, rank it in number three. And if it's a concern, but it's just not a top concern, go ahead and rank it in number two. And what I'll do is we'll give the husband and wife each, if it's a, if it's a married couple coming in, we'll give them, it takes about two or three minutes and they start reading through these. And they might, and I do this interactively, I don't do it as homework because they're gonna probably have some questions, clarifying questions on what certain things mean. And it gives an opportunity to quickly just educate them on what some of these different topics are. But I wanna share you know, a, a story because it also facilitates a conversation. Sometimes, believe it or not, the husband and wife aren't exactly on the same page. Maybe the husband ranked it in number one, but the, rank, the wife ranked it in number three. And that's an incredible opportunity for you to be able to facilitate a conversation between the two and help get an alignment between the two. 
And an example of that, about two or three weeks ago, I was on a, a mentoring call with one of our advisors out of Texas, and they had just implemented this tool, and she was telling me the story about it. She said that when the husband and wife got to the one that we have highlighted on the screen right now, the nursing home, assisted living, and home health care wiping out the estate, the wife ranked it a number one, but the husband ranked it a number three. And so when they finished it, she proceeded, you know, and we teach this in our, our interactive live training on the bucket plan that we do, but we teach how to have those kind of probing questions around this topic. So uh, the advisor, she basically sat back and said, you know, Cindy, you ranked, you ranked this a number one, but Jim, you ranked it a number three. Can you tell me more about that? Cindy, why is this a top concern for you? And Jim, why is it not a concern at all? And and, and the wife, Cindy, she began to talk about an ex, a personal experience that she had that her mother and her sister lived in Florida. And as I mentioned earlier, she was in Texas. And her mother fell, ended up having to get some home health care, never really recovered. It uh, ended up spiraling into, you know, eventually moving into assisted living, nursing home. And as we all know, with the cost of care, it did not take long to wipe out you know, they're, they're her retirement assets. And so uh, Cindy and Jim, they were, they were pretty well off financially and obviously living almost across the country. Cindy's sister wasn't that financially well off. And so they kind of split duties. And the sister really ended up helping be the caretaker for the mom, but didn't participate financially in a lot of things. Cindy ended up paying a lot of the bills, but not actually being the caretaker. And so the advisor continued on with probing questions of, you know, sympathetic. Oh, that must have been such a hard situation. You know, how did that make you feel? And as that advisor was asking these probing questions, Cindy was just like, it was horrible, you know, because eventually it drove me and my sister apart. We each felt like we had an unfair proportion of the responsibility and the liability. She thought she had the, the burden of the caretaking side of it. I thought I had the burden of the financial impact. And it ended up driving our close relationship apart where we hardly speak anymore. And she said, you know, I never want that to happen for our three children. And you know, it was one of those personal connections the advisor shared with me because this advisor in particular, she more focused on like retirement income planning. She never really did a lot of, you know, asset protection, long term care, asset based long term care, nursing home assisted living type of planning. But what that conversation did, and it's funny, she said the husband, Jim, immediately perked up and was like, you know what, I'm going to rank that a number one also. I don't want that to happen to our kids. But it facilitated a conversation and it gave the advisor the knowledge of how she should proceed forward with the rest of that conversation. She ended up talking about how to protect their own, you know, uh, uh, assets from any kind of, you know, nursing home assisted living or got home health care. Yeah, she got That's to the pain. Yeah. She was able to focus on it. She pivoted from talking about retirement income, which she normally would have, to focusing on that pain first. And then after she showed them some really unique solutions there, she got them as a client, right? And that's what it's all about. She ended up getting all the retirement income stuff done. But these types of conversations come up all the time. I mean, Jason, you could probably rattle off a hundred of them. You've been using this document for what, 15 years now? Yes. Uh, probably close to it. Yep. So, so just a great tool to help uncover and get to the concerns or the pain quickly. And then, uh, and so this is where I was saying DOS, it's kind of a follow-up to the Dan Sullivan question is that three-year question. And then you talk about the dangers and then we've developed that tool to help facilitate that conversation by having them rank it. And then we follow up with opportunities and strengths. So opportunities is where we're taking them, talking about something pretty, you know, heavy, right? And, and you know, identifying the pain. Now we want to pick them up. And, uh, and, and get them happy and cheerful. Right. And, and also identify if there are any, uh, maybe anything they're excited about, anything they're looking forward to. Sometimes it's a business opportunity. Sometimes it's a 
opportunity to buy a vacation home or to retire or a trip that they're going on or a wedding that's coming up or whatever it is, but it's a good conversation piece too to pivot the conversation and then also in future meetings to kind of follow up and be like, hey, how was that wedding? Or hey, what's going on with this? So, uh, and then lastly, the strengths. The strengths can be really powerful with a husband and wife because we'll ask them to kind of talk about each other. And so uh, you really identify the person you're sitting with and uh, how they're hardwired. So you're gonna spot your engineers or your people who absolutely love their family and it's all about the family and you'll know how to kind of cater those conversations. Um, I like this one again, like if I start to under, know that, you know, in the last one, when I ask about strengths and they're talking about what a great, you know, mother or grandmother or whatever it is, and they're talking about their family, um, what are the three most important values you've tried to teach to your children that you would want them to teach your grandchildren? That is a power question, man, for people who really are, are all about their family, their kids and grandkids. I mean, it's uh, that's something nobody's ever asked them before and uh, and can really be a game changer in your relationship development early on with them. Another game changer is this one at the bottom. Are you familiar with per stirpes or per capita beneficiary designations? And have you gone through each beneficiary designation to ensure they're titled properly? And you could imagine most people are like, huh, what's that? You know, and you'll know at this point through the fact finding process if they have grandchildren. If they have grandchildren, this can be an incredible educational opportunity to inform them on the difference between per stirpes and per capita. We're not going to get to that in this webinar here, but informing them on the difference in that the default is per capita and if they haven't gone through each one of their beneficiary designations on all their accounts to ensure they're titled properly, they could potentially disinherit grandchildren. And so for the advisors on this call that are familiar with per stirpes and per capita, you know how powerful of a conversation that could be. And having this question right here just prompts you to remember to talk about it and this one thing could be a reason that prospects end up hiring you and moving forward with you. It shows the attention to detail their other advisor didn't have. Absolutely, <laughs> that's cases. so true. Yeah. Absolutely. And so another great kind of open-ended question just to get them talking is, when we start talking about investment experience, tell me about the best investment you've ever made and then just wait for a pause. Right. Pause. Wait for the answer. Tell me about the best investment you've ever made. Get kind of, you know, inside of their mind on how they might think or have preconceived opinions about products or portfolios or strategies they've invested in in the past. And then once they've shared with you the best, flip over. Tell me about the worst investment you've ever made. You're going to hear all kinds of things that maybe they have negative opinions on. And wouldn't you want to be armed with that information? Certainly before you go to make recommendations, right? They might tell you about things they've got really bad experiences with or their neighbor told them about some horrible investment or annuity or something that they bought that they never want to, you know, even go close to putting any of their money in. You also get a good idea of like, you know, how, how sophisticated of an investor are they? Right. And do they even know much about investments or are they just more savers that sock it away in the 401k? Really don't know how to talk much about their house or their four other than their house and 401k. It's kind of like all they know about. Um, we're not going to talk about the pyramid of risks and the ranking, but this is really uh, to go even a level deeper, which we typically do in the second meeting, you know, where we do an educational process to smoke out any negative preconceived conceptions around products or portfolios that we may recommend later on before we recommend them. We want to, we want to identify those by using the pyramid of risk, at risk as an educational tool. Now, uh, um, the other uh, thing I like to ask is, has anyone ever developed a written financial plan for you? Do you have a written plan? I see where you have, you have all these statements and you've done a great job of saving money, but you have a blueprint to follow. 
and they uh, they almost always say no. Now some people do. Some people have oh it's outdated though or whatever it is. But uh, but in, when the ones that don't have it, it's like an aha moment for them. It's like whoa no I don't have a blueprint. I do not have a written financial plan. And then this is an interesting section. You created this. Talk a little bit about how you have them rank their other professionals. Yeah, I mean, I love this. I had a recent experience. So this first one is, you know, their current financial advisor, right? And so on a one to five, so I had a husband and wife and uh, ask them to rank on a one to five. And we're, you know, this is getting near the end of the meeting. This is the final part of the fact finder. So it's coming close to, to the end of the meeting. And uh, if you haven't picked up already kind of how strong the relationship has, this is a great way to like make sure you actually have them rank it. So I'd, I'll add some humor. I'll say, you know, on a one to five, um, you know, five being the best. Five, five is like they're over for Thanksgiving dinner, right? You got a close relationship. You know, a one is like they're not doing good at all. What would you consider on a one to five? How close are you and how great of a job is it that your current financial advisor is doing? And so the woman spoke up first, actually, and she said a four. And then uh, he turned to her, Jerry did, and said um, four. He's like, you realize he's the reason we owed all that tax on our tax uh, when we uh, filed our taxes because of the trading he was doing in that account. We had all those uh, gains on the investments that we didn't realize when he made those trades. And she's like, oh, that was his fault? She's like, oh, he's a two. And so what a great th thing now to get that out of them of like, where do they, where are they at on their current advisors? And do the same thing on, you know, their other professionals they may or may not have in the house, attorney, tax professional, insurance agent, et cetera. So we're going to go through uh, about 12 supplemental questions. We're going to kind of rifle through these, and, and we use these uh, in different scenarios. These aren't things you're going to ask to every prospect you sit down with, but there's definitely times you want to basically pull, in, pull out these questions because it could help you know, maybe solidify something that the prospect shared with you earlier or create an opportunity. So, uh, Jason, what's the first supplemental question you use here? If given the choice, would you rather have the opportunity to be rich or the guarantee you will never be poor? And that's just a fun question. People like that never have. No one's ever asked that before of them. And, you know, it's they kind of get a little chuckle out of it and they enjoy answering it. But it's also insightful for them to answer for themselves. It's about a little bit how much how much of a risk taker are they, right? Right. And as you think about your life, what kind of things are most important to you? And that's that's a deep question. That's insightful. And the people who you've realized already, because you've spent an hour or so with them now, you're going to know the ones that you might want to pull that out on. It's the ones who, who got a little deeper with you when you were uh, going through um, and having the conversations around those early questions, the three-year question and the dangers, et cetera. So I know both of us do a lot of tax planning, and this next one is something I, I always ask, but are you charitably inclined and what charities are important to you? And the reason that is so important to ask is in today's tax environment with a higher standard deduction, which most people are taking now, there are some really unique planning opportunities with qualified charitable distributions, QCDs for those over 70 and a half, or the utilization of donor advised funds for people that are under, where we could do staggered charitable giving to help create tax efficiency for them. And so if you can find this out, you're going to know leading into, you know, sharing with them things that you can do to help them, whether either of those two strategies are viable. Nobody's talking about deduction stacking and how you can utilize donor advised funds. They've never even heard that stuff before. Absolutely. And not their CPA or, or their other financial advisors. So it's an opportunity to really differentiate yourself. And then the last one, again, I had this come up last week, but have you done anything to set up lifetime guaranteed income on any of your retirement accounts? And so I had somebody that came in, they, you know, typical, they had all their money in their 401k. They hadn't really been doing anything else. And just asking them that question, you know, they, they actually had a really small pension from years and years ago. It was going to be like minimal. 
but they instantly understood the concept and they're like, well, I don't think I have anything like that in my current 401k. And I was like, yeah, but when you turn 59 and a half, there's ways to move it even while you're still working. And there's ways for a portion of this money to basically create almost like a private pension with lifetime guaranteed income. And they instantly knew, you know, and they could relate to that small pension that they see this, this little monthly benefit on. And so a great supplemental question. And then one of our, uh, one of our mastermind members, one of our really good friends, a, a gentleman named Curtis Cloak. Uh, Curtis is the founder of Thrive Income Distribution, uh, founder of a software that we use, Retirement Next Gen, uh, has, has a great training for advisors as well. A lot of our, our mastermind advisors have been through it. But he's put together some of these questions. He calls getting to the heart of the matter. He shared these with Jason and I a couple months ago. Yeah, and he's actually going to deliver them at our uh, mastermind collegiate oh, that's right. up in June at the Top 5 Roundtable. And we've been hearing stories of some of our advisors that have incorporated these questions into their first meeting and seen really good results. So we wanted to include these in here. Uh, Jason, why don't you go through the first couple of these? Yeah, so where are you from and what was it like growing up? Um, I mean, that's a great way just as you're making the connection, right? Is like just kind of, you know, some, some advisors have trouble figuring out what to talk about, right? And how to get people talking. They're not real good small talk makers. I'm a good example of that. I was, I was, I was really bad at small talk and still, until I started using some of these crutches. You know, I just, I'm not a big weather kind of guy. So, you know, oh, how's the weather? I don't know. I just don't like doing it. So, but these are more, you know, you're kind of really getting to know them. You know how some people it just, I mean, until you, our, our good friends, John Del Greco, uh, says to us, until you see their eyes hugging you. You do not move forward with, you know, the, the, the meeting, right? And so here's a great question uh, that can help you do that. What was the most important lesson you learned about money growing up, right? So that's, that's another good one that you'll get some great responses from. Um, what was the hardest lesson you've had about money? So if they didn't have anything on that first one, because it was more growing up, um, and I think, I don't want a lesion. I don't want to learn <laughs> the second one, important lesion. you learn. But anyways, uh, the spelling error, sorry. And then uh, hardest lesson you, you had about money growing up. So that's uh, uh, hardest lesson you had about money. So that's more in your adulthood, right? If they didn't have like a childhood one on the question number two. And then on the fourth one, you know, what's the best lesson you've had about money? So it's the hardest and then what's the best? Right. And one of those questions of those, that first one's just fantastic about getting them to open up and make the connection. Those follow up three after that, you're going to get something good out of asking out of one of those three questions for sure. And I love the next one. I, I work with a lot of younger clients. They're still working. So, you know, a lot of their their daily life is consumed at the office. Um, but what would you do with your time if no one paid you, right? Getting them to start again, opening up to what do they like to enjoy? What are their hobbies? What are their interests? Where and do I they want to spend what, their It's time? important like to ask your clients before they retire to get them in that mindset. I mean, I've made that mistake with my father-in-law of not counseling him. I'm like, what are you going to do with your time? And when he retired, I mean, he got really bummed out big time. Because it was like he lost his sense of purpose. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, one of our advisors, Dave Buckwalt, says once you retire, every day is a Saturday. You know, so uh, just being able to figure out what they're going to do with that time. Uh, is there something important about your money? I wouldn't know if I didn't ask. Right. So that could be just if they have a little, anything little. You know, some people are, you know, have different quirky things going on with their money that, that you might get out on the table. In retirement, how much of your income is okay to have at risk? And in retirement, how much of your assets are okay to have at risk? So again, helping get them to that concept or idea that, you know, income and assets, number one, it's two different things, right? Number two, uh, how much of it's okay uh, with, with having at risk? Yeah, great questions. Thank you, Curtis. Yeah, appreciate it. So um, in kind of closing up here, what we just spent the last you know, 30, 40, 50 minutes talking about, whatever it's been, is 
something that we teach in the onset of the overall holistic planning process, which is the bucket plan. So a lot of people are familiar with bucket planning. You know, it's been around for a very long time, but I think what you will see is that this is not just an income distribution strategy. This is an entire holistic planning process, starting with some of the key components of the fact finder, uncovering and identifying pain, being able to ask probing questions to inspire and motivate them to move forward. And then of course, all the rest, which we didn't cover in this call, which is actually how to go build and design and produce a simplified plan that your clients can understand that gives them the peace of mind and helps make them a client for your overall business. Uh, this is the book, Jason wrote it. It's the best-selling book, The Bucket Plan, Protecting and Growing Your Assets for a Worry for Your Retirement. Ed Slot wrote the forward for it, and a lot of different media outlets across the country have given great reviews about the bucket plan, and we've seen it just transform the lives of so many advisors. I know it did for my individual business. It's done it for Jason's as well. And we conduct training across the country on the bucket plan. You want to give them some, some information on the next training? Jason? Yeah, absolutely. If you find value, if you found value in this webinar, then be on the next one. But if you want to do something way better, come spend a couple days with us. So we bring top advisors from all over the country, business partners of ours that are running very successful financial services practice. We have four offices that average $40 million a year in new assets that you can come learn directly from all of these strategies. And so things you saw in this webinar and so much more that we're going to give you the tools. We're going to hand you, you're going to be able to go back to your practice and then actually implement the things you learned. So this is a live training event. This is not a dog and pro pony show. This is where you're going to come. You're going to gain access to ideas, tools, systems, things that you can actually go back and implement in your practice. It's here in our hometown, Cleveland, June 19th and 20th. So to register, you can call 888-240-1923. Talk to anyone on our business development team. If you were referred over to watch this webinar by somebody on our business development team, reach back out to them, have them get you more details. Go to c2pevents.com, learn about the speakers, see the bios. As Jason mentioned, four offices that gathered over $40 million each using the same systems, the same processes. You just saw a glimpse of it today. In addition to that, you get to knock out a bunch of CE credits. If you're a certified financial planner or an insurance professional, you're gonna earn CE by going through this training. So go ahead, reach out to us, get all the details. We'll see you in June on the 19th and 20th in Cleveland, Ohio. In addition to that, Hopefully, as Jason mentioned earlier, you've seen the white paper available, increase your closing ratio. We opened it up by saying 72.3%. Hopefully you've seen, no matter what that percentage point turns out to be, by implementing just a few of the concepts and strategies you learned in today's webinar, you'll absolutely see greater results in your appointment process as you begin to work with prospects on uncovering their pain, asking great questions and motivating them to hire you as their financial advisor. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you on next month's webinar. The Bucket Plan On Demand series is brought to you by Clarity to Prosperity, a financial training, coaching and IP development organization led by financial advisors, coaches and business leaders committed to taking a holistic approach on advising. To learn more about our organization and upcoming training opportunities for financial professionals, visit Clarity2Prosperity.com.